I am Matti van Oef, and together with Tom van Goetem, we will be presenting Timeless Timing Attacks. Tom is a researcher at the Distrinet Group in KU Leuven in Belgium. He's a fanatic web and network security enthusiast, and he likes to exploit side channel leaks in browsers and more generally in web platforms. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at NYU Abu Dhabi, and later this year I will start as a professor at KU Leuven. I'm interested in wireless security, software security, and also a bit of applied crypto. And previously I discovered the crack attack against WPA2 and the RC4 no more attack. In this presentation we will be talking about timing attacks and timing leaks. And let's start with three simple examples of a timing leak. So the first example on the top left is a quite straightforward timing leak. If some secret condition is true, then extra computation is performed. And here the adversary can recover whether the secret condition was true or not based on the execution time. An example on the top right, we have a for loop that goes through all the elements in an array. And once an element has been found with a certain secret property, then the for loop is terminated. In other words, the number of iterations that the for loop executes depend on some kind of secret information. And this also means that the number of iterations that are executed leaks information to an adversary. Finally, at the bottom we have a timing leak where if an array is not empty, then extra computation is performed. You can, for instance, for instance, imagine a case where there is a search functionality on the website and if you are searching for a keyword and this keyword occurs in a secret document, then extra computation is performed, which again leaks information. Now, how can these timing leaks be exploited using a traditional timing attack? Well, the adversary, of course, needs to connect to the target server the adversary possibly needs to send a large number of requests and for each request the adversary measures how long it took the server to send a response. And then the adversary will compare the response time of a baseline request with a target request. Now what do I mean with a baseline request? Well, a baseline request is for example the first time leak here where the adversary knows that the secret condition will evaluate to false. And then in the target re request, we do not know uh, whether the secret condition will evaluate to false or true. And instead we derive that by determining if there is a difference in the response time between the baseline where we know the condition is false and between the target where we do not know what this condition will evaluate to. So in our time in timing attacks, we will be we will always be comparing the baseline with a target. And to determine whether there really is a difference between the baseline and the target, we will use statistical tests. Now, what is the performance of these timing attacks? Well, it depends on various variables, it depends on the network connection between the attacker and the server. So if there is more jitter, the performance of the attack will degrade. An attacker can try to mitigate this to some extent by moving closer to the target, for instance by renting a server in the same cloud provider of the victim. And just to remark here, the jitter can be present both on the upstream, so on the requests, and on the downstream, so on the responses. Another important factor is the size of the timing leaks. So it's much easier to exploit a large timing leak of, say, 50 milliseconds than it is to exploit a small timing leak of, for instance, 5 microseconds. Finally, the number of measurements that you can make also heavily influence the performance of the attack. So the more measurements you can make, the better the performance of uh, a timing attack. And Tom will now graphically illustrate how a timing attack works. Okay, so let's see how this attack works in practice. So we have our attacker on the left side and the server on the right side. And it's a remote attack as you can see, because uh, well, the packets need to go over the internet over several hops. So what the attacker does is he will 
uh, send the request and start at the same time the timer. And only when the re response has been received, uh, the attacker will stop the timer. Um, so the attacker will have to do this uh, multiple times and record every time how long it took to uh, process the request. Um, so here we see another example and in the last hop you can see that there was a bit of jitter um, causing the, the request to be delayed. Um, and that resulted in a higher uh, timing measurement. Um, so the attacker will have to do this uh, many times over and then uh, try to use some statistic analysis uh, to see what the actual timing without uh, the consequences of jitter uh, for the, re the processing the request will be. Um, so to see uh, what what could actually be achieved with such a, a timing attack, uh, we did some experiments. Uh, so from our university network, we launched attacks against uh, servers that we set up on AWS uh, in different parts of the world. So we set a server up in the EU, the US and Asia. And then we try to see uh, like with 95% with accuracy, how many requests were required uh, to detect a timing difference. Um, and we ranged this timing difference between uh, five microseconds and 50 microseconds. So as you can see, um, for 50 microseconds, uh, we managed to find, uh, to detect uh, this uh, timing difference in all uh, servers. And so it took 333 requests uh, to find, uh, to, to detect this timing difference in the EU server, uh, a bit more than 4,000 for the US and more than 7,000 for the server in Asia. And also, as the timing difference goes lower, um, you can see that either uh, many more requests are required uh, to perform this statistical analysis, or it's simply not possible. So for uh, the server in the US, a timing difference of 10 microseconds was no longer possible to detect um, with, with less than 100,000 uh, measurements. And that brings us to the timeless timing attacks. Um, so, as we see from the um, from the example before, uh, we know that the the absolute response timing is quite unreliable uh, because it will always include jitter for every request. So we thought, like, okay, why not just get rid of the notion of time? Uh, so that's why we call these attacks timeless. Um, and then, well, when we don't have any time and still want to do uh, timing attacks, uh, we have to uh, find something different. So we found that we can actually use uh, or exploit concurrency. And um, instead of looking at the time of the request, uh, we send two requests at the same time and then uh, look at their um, the response order. Uh, so this means that we don't no longer need any absolute timing measurements. And uh, as a result, uh, these timeless timing attacks are completely unaffected by network jitter. Um, so let's look at this diagram on how this would work in practice. So we have the exact same uh, setup. Um, exact here, you can see that the attacker is no longer using a clock to measure the time uh, it takes to send the request. Um, so the attacker sends two uh, requests at the same time. Uh, they uh, arrive at the server and then they're processed uh, in parallel. And of course, there can only be one uh, who finishes processing first. And uh, so this will be the light blue one. Um, and this will also be the order in which they are received by the attacker. And uh, so the attacker can from this infer that the, the light blue, which uh, matches the, the light uh, pink one, uh, that request uh, managed to process before uh, the darker one. Now, if we again have the same example, but here we see uh, there was still a, uh, some jitter 
in the, the network path from the attacker to the server, uh, we see that the packets still arrive at the same time at the server. So they're still processed at exactly the same time. And again, uh, we see that the uh, light blue response uh, is generated first. So this uh, indicates that the processing time of this light pink request uh, took less time. Thank you, Tom. So what are the requirements to perform a timeless timing attack? Well, first and for all, the requests need to arrive at the same time at the server. The server needs to process requests concurrently and the response order needs to reflect the difference in the execution time of both requests. So let's explore these three requirements in more detail. The first requirement that the two requests have to arrive at the same time can be fulfilled using two options, namely by either relying on multiplexing or by relying on encapsulation. An example where we can rely on multiplexing is the HTTP2 protocol, which supports concurrent requests. So with HTTP2, we, send, we can send two requests uh, at the same time, and they will be sent and processed in parallel. Moreover, a single request, well, actually a single TCP packet can carry two HTTP requests at the same time that will then also be pro processed concurrently. Another option is to rely on encapsulation. And here our example is to exploit HTTP 1 when that protocol is run over Tor or over a VPN connection. And let me illustrate both examples graphically. So with multiplexing, we can put two HTTP requests shown in gray here at the top in a single TCP packet shown in blue. For HTTP 1 over Tor, we would be targeting an onion service. And here at the bottom, again, the two HTTP requests are shown in gray. And here, each HTTP 1 request is put into a separate TCP packet shown in red. And in turn, this TCP packet is put into a separate Tor cell packet. However, what the adversary then does is that the adversary assures that these two Tor cells will be aggregated into one single TCP packet. And when that single TCP packet arrives at the server, then the server will effectively process both HTTP 1 requests at the same time. Now, for the second requirement, the second requirement is that these two requests have to be processed concurrently. And whether that is done depends on the application. So with some implementations, they may still handle requests sequentially. Other implementations may handle them in parallel. One thing to watch out for here is that if an encryption protocol is used on top, then sometimes that encryption protocol may require that the decryption happens uh, sequentially. The third requirement is that the order of responses has to reflect the order of the execution time. Or in other words, the server must generate and send a response immediately after it finished processing the request. Additionally, the order of responses must still be the same when, it, when they arrive at the adversary. And most of the cases, that is actually the case, and this is because both responsible responses follow the same network path. But even if for some reasons these responses are reordered, then the adversary can still look at the TCP sequence number or the TCP timestamps to recover the original order in which the server sent those responses. So how performant is the attack in practice? Well, if we compare to sequential timing attacks, Tom already explained the first part of this uh, table here. Now we also added how many requests we need when performing a traditional timing attack over LAN and over the localhost. For instance, to measure a five microsecond timing leak over the localhost, we need a bit more than 40 requests. On the other hand, for a timeless timing attack, no matter where we are on the internet, to measure the same timing leak, 
we only need about 50 requests per. While, for instance, the five microsecond meek cannot be exploited uh, remotely over the internet. It can only be done in the same LAN or localhost, while with a timeless attack, we can exploit that leak anywhere. And I also want to highlight that the smallest time leak that we could exploit was a timing leak of 100 nanoseconds. And this really shows that timeless timing attacks offer an order of magnitude improvement over traditional timing leaks. Even, it even improves over some uh, timing attacks over the local host. So that explains how a direct timing attack works. It is also possible to perform a cross-site timeless timing attack and to perform a timeless timing attack over Wi-Fi. And Tom will now explain how the cross-site timing attack works. So this cross-site timing attack is actually a bit different from the timing attack that we saw before. Uh, so in the previous timing attack, it's a direct timing attack. The attacker uh, directly connects to the, the target server. Um, and with this cross-site timing attack, it's actually the victim uh, with their browser uh, who will be connecting to the uh, target server. Um, and so the, the threat model is a bit different. Uh, so here in the cross-site timing attack, uh, the attack can be launched uh, when the victim lands on a malicious website. Uh, so this could be uh, caused by clicking on a malicious link or there would be an, a malicious advertisement of the attacker or the, the victim really has an urgent need to look at cute animal videos. Uh, so as long as the attacker is able to launch uh, JavaScript uh, in order to trigger requests to the targeted web server, uh, it's possible to, to perform this attack. Um, and the reason why this is, is because the, the victim's cookies will be um, automatically included in the request. So this means that the request will be processed uh, using the victim's authentication. Um, and what the attacker then needs to do is to observe the response order in which the, the requests are processed and returned. Uh, so this can be easily done using the fetch API. And then uh, the attacker can uh, leak sensitive information that the user shared uh, or the victim shared with the website. So to give a, an example of this, um, is a bug that we found in Hacker One, uh, where we could abuse uh, the search function uh, to see if there were any results uh, with a given search term, uh, which would include uh, information about private reports. Uh, so th this, um, vulnerability was actually detected a, a couple of times before um, and there uh, people reported it using a, a well, regular timing attack um, and it was not really uh, feasible to exploit it um, and so with these timeless timing attacks we managed to actually uh, improve uh, the, the, well, the timing leak uh, and we could actually uh, quite uh, consistently uh, reproduce uh, the vulnerability and search for uh, information about private reports. Um, so, because now the attacker is, is running JavaScript, they no longer have uh, low level control over uh, the network connections uh, as they did in the direct time attack because the browser is the one that chooses how to uh, send the requests or send the packets to the kernel, which will forward it, them uh, to the target server. Uh, so this means that the attacker needs another technique uh, to ensure that uh, the two requests are uh, put into a single packet. Uh, fortunately, uh, we can leverage some uh, things of TCP, uh, namely the, the TCP congestion control. Um, so this, this mechanism prevents the client from uh, sending all packets at once. And uh, so the, the client can send uh, a packet uh, depending on the, the current congestion window. Uh, and before sending more packets, it will need an acknowledgement from the server. Um, and as well, well, when uh, requests are queued, um, they 
and the, the, the acknowledgement hasn't been received yet, uh, the, the following uh, requests will be merged into a single packet. Um, so the attack is fairly uh, straightforward, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so what the attacker just needs to do is first send a bogus uh, post request with a very long body uh, in order to fill um, the congestion window. Um, so this is just a, a body with a very long string. Um, and after that, uh, the, the congestion window will be used up and uh, the browser will need to wait uh, or the kernel will have to wait for sending the, the next packets uh, before an acknowledgement from the server has, re has been received. Um, so before that happens, uh, the, the attacker will send two more uh, fetch requests and these are the, the requests that uh, they're interested, the attacker is in, interested in to know the relative uh, response order. So let's see how this works in practice. Uh, so we have our malicious attacker uh, ex well, running some JavaScript on a website that's being visited by the client. Um, so with this first uh, post request, uh, the attackers well, or the victims uh, TCP packet queue is uh, filled up and uh, so it already sends um, something like 10 TCP packets to the server um, and of course it includes the, the cookie um, in, the, in this request. Um, and then, well, the, the client will have to wait before sending uh, the rest of the packets. And in this period, uh, the client will, or, or the, the attacker will already launch another fetch request. Um, but, well, there's still a queue, so then it will, this request will be appended to the queue. Um, and then the second one uh, will also be appended to the queue. Um, and so here, um, so the, the, the packet queue that we see here, uh, it represents all the different uh, all the different TCP packets that will be sent. Um, and we can see that uh, the, the light pink and the dark pink uh, requests will be merged into a single packet. Um, so once the, the acknowledgement from the server has arrived, uh, the queue will be cleared and the requests uh, so both requests will be uh, forced into a single packet and then send off to the server. So this, uh, in, so in this presentation, we already covered the direct timing attacks, and uh, I now just covered also the cross-site timing attacks. And now uh, Mati will be looking into a third attack scenario, uh, namely where we. Uh, attack the Wi-Fi content. So it is also possible to perform timeless timing attacks over Wi-Fi. And in particular, we will target the EAP PWD protocol when used in a WPA2 network. So with WPA2, and in particular with enterprise networks, authentication can be done using certificates, but those can be annoying to configure, so a significant amount of networks will instead use EAP PWD where authentication can easily be done using a username and a password. In this case, the authentication happens between the client on the authentication server, for instance, free radius, and the access point simply forwards messages between the client and the authentication server. Because the authentication server can be located anywhere on the internet, the connection between the access point and the server is typically protected using TLS which is called a RATSEC connection. And EPPWD will use the hash to curve algorithm to verify the password. Unfortunately, in previous research, a timing leak was discovered in this algorithm, namely the dragon blood attack. But against EPPWD, this attack seemed hard to perform because this timing difference was small and it was unclear whether multiple measurements could be made so that then uh, the timing measurements could be combined. In other words, this timing leak was considered impossible to exploit in practice. 
However, using the timeliness technique, we can exploit this. And how does this work? Well, the adversary will spoof three clients. The two clients will associate as normal to the access point. The access point will request their identity. The clients will send their identity to the free radio server. And the free radio server replies back uh, that, hey, you are now going to have to start the EAP PWD protocol. This is all very normal. Nothing special has happened so far. But the fun stuff happens now. Because what will the adversary do now? Instead of continuing immediately with the EAP PWD protocol, the adversary will send a special authentication packet which will be forwarded over the RATSEC connection, so over the TLS connection to the free radius server. And it causes the buffer of the access point to fill up with packets. And because this buffer is now full, when the two clients now send their EAP PWD authentication response, this authentication response will be combined into a single TLS packet over the RATSEC connection. But let me also highlight one other thing. These two EAP PWD authentication responses, they are sent in a single physical Wi-Fi frame. In particular, they are sent in a single physical AMPDU frame, meaning that both these authentication responses arrive at exactly the same time at the access point. And as I mentioned, the buffer in the access point is now starting to get full. And as a consequence of that, both these authentication requests will be combined in a single TLS record towards the free radio server. In other words, this means that free radius receives both authentication requests at exactly the same time. And then free radius will respond to the clients where the authentication request finished processing first. So in this case, free radius first finished processing the request from client one and the response shown in light blue here is sent first while the response of client two is sent later. And you can also see here over Wi-Fi, we can see that client one received the reply first and client two received a reply later. And this order of responses leak enough information to then perform a brute force offline dictionary attack against the password of the user. And in our experiments, we can indeed see that this, uh, that the order we receive these responses at our Wi-Fi clients indeed corresponds to the difference in execution on the free radio server. So to put that differently, only in less than 1% of the cases do we incorrectly derive the execution time on the server. And as mentioned, we can use this information to perform a dictionary attack against the password of the victim. So if we take the Rockyou database dump of passwords, which contains about 40 million passwords, we need about 40 measurements. And with those 40 measurements, we can then with uh, 86 success probability derive the password of the victim, at least if the password is in this network dump. dump. And the cost of that brute force attack is less than $1 when you perform it on the cloud. So as a quick recap, we have now shown direct timing attacks, we have shown cross-site timing attacks, and we have shown a timeless timing attack over Wi-Fi authentication. And with that, I hand back over to Tom. All right, so now it's time for a little demonstration. So for this demo, I created an example application called The Vault, um, where people can enter their documents with a title and then uh, the content. And for these documents, they can set a required security level. So one is for documents that can be that are public um, and can be accessed by anyone. And then there are documents that are top secrets that can only be um, well, accessed by people with the correct security clearance. Um, so uh, I've already entered a lot of documents, like a couple of hundred documents into the vault. And there's a single one that is set to top secret. 
so the the website also has a search functionality where we can search for simple strings like the and then we get a bunch of results um, and there this single uh, well, secret document contains the string black hat um, and we can look for it and we can see that actually we don't find any documents and that's because we don't have the right security clearance uh, but still this uh, application is vulnerable to a timing attack and this is how we will leak the password from uh, uh, the document. Uh, so I, I will briefly show where the timing leak is. Um, so the uh, search functionality works a bit like this. So there's a text search happening on uh, all the documents uh, based on the query parameter uh, that is provided in uh, by the user or in this case the attacker. Um, and then the application will check if there's more than one document found. And if that's the case, it will get the security level of the current user. Um, and in order to do this, uh, it will uh, perform one additional uh, SQL query. Um, and it will only do so if there's more than one document uh, that needs to be filtered. Um, and th this is where the, the security issue is, uh, the timing leak, because this allows us to know whether there was at least one document that matched uh, the text search. So then the attack looks as follows. Um, we here uh, make use of the H2, H2 time uh, library, uh, which is uh, what we used um, for our research. And we also published this on GitHub. And I'll be sharing uh, the link later in the presentation. Uh, so we defined two get requests. Uh, the first one, R1, uh, contains the actual guess. And then R2 um, has uh, the add sign as a guess. And because the add sign is not part of the character set, uh, there will never be any matching documents found. So we can use this as a baseline. And then we use H2 time to launch the attack. And as a result, we receive uh, a bunch of uh, values. Uh, so 15 values. Um, and then we see how many uh, negative values there are. Um, and this is because a negative value indicates that the order in which the response was returned is reversed. So this means that um, if we send R1 and R2, uh, then the response for R2 will be received before that the one of R1. And uh, this would be the case if uh, R1 took longer to process. Um, so then the probability of this is higher. Um, and well, this is also the case when it's a correct uh, character of the password, because then we need this additional SQL query to get the user's security level. And then we see if this the percentage of the reverse order is higher than a certain threshold. Um, in the example uh, that I uh, will be running soon, uh, the threshold is set to 80%. All right, so now let's run the attack. Uh, to do so, we just need to run attack.py with Python. Um, so here we can see um, all the characters that have been found so far on the top line. So far there's no character. Um, but as you can see, the first character has just been found. So we have the capital T. Um, and then the second line uh, show, shows the characters that are currently being guessed. Um, so we just saw that the one was just found. Um, so we're guessing one character at a time. Um, and then the, the third line shows the percentage, percentage of the responses that were uh, returned in the reverse order. Um, and well, as you can see, uh, when um, the guess is incorrect, um, the, or, well, the percentage uh, is closer to 50%. Um, of course, this is uh, 
there is still some amount of chance involved uh, because, um, well, if it's an incorrect guess, then uh, there's for each request a 50% chance uh, that it will be in the correct order or in the reverse order. Um, so it's at the moment going fairly well. Um, so it already found several, several characters. So um, the, the demonstration is uh, also publicly available uh, on GitHub. Um, uh, you can just run it uh, with Docker. Um, and I will also be sharing the link later in the presentation. Um, so far, um, all except one character have been correctly guessed. Um, and that should be the last one. Yeah, and that's also a correct guess. Um, so as you can see, uh, the tech uh, was successful and we managed to find uh, the secret password, namely timeless timing. So that brings us to the conclusion. Um, so we find that uh, these timeless timing attacks are not affected by network jitter at all. Uh, this is because the two requests arrive in the same packet at the exact same time at the server. Uh, and this allows us to perform remote timing attacks uh, with an accuracy that is similar to as if the attack was uh, launched on the local system. So in our demonstration, uh, that well, we showed that uh, the attack is quite practical. Um, the attack was launched from uh, my home uh, on a not all too great Wi-Fi connection against a server that's located in the US, whereas I'm located in, located in the EU. Um, and still, the, the timeless time index allowed us to detect this very small timing difference. Um, so we find that uh, these attacks can be launched against protocols that either feed, well, either enable uh, multiplexing, uh, for instance HTTP/2, or uh, that, or where we can leverage a transport protocol uh, that en enables encapsulation, uh, for instance Tor or uh, VPN. And then finally, uh, all the protocols that meet uh, these cr criteria. Uh, may be susceptible to these timeless timing attacks. And we already created practical attacks against HTTP2 and EAPWD, uh, which is for Wi-Fi authentication. So with that, I would like to thank you for uh, listening. Um, and you can, uh, if you have any questions or remarks or uh, ideas, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us on Twitter. And you can find uh, the, the sources of uh, the H2 time uh, library on the left side and the sources for the demonstration on the right side. So thank you.